happiness. When mental energy is allowed to flow in the line of least resistance and to fall into easy channels, it is called weakness. When it is gathered, focused and forced into upward and different directions, it becomes power and this concentration of energy and acquisition of power is brought about by means of self-control. In speaking of self-control, one is easily misunderstood. It should not be associated with a destructive repression, but with a constructive expression. This process is not one of death, but of life. It is a divine and masterly transmutation in which the weak is converted into the strong, the coarse into the fine, and the base into the noble, in which virtue takes the place of vice and dark passion is lost in bright intellectuality. The man who merely smothers up and hides away his real nature, without any higher object in view than to create a good impression upon others concerning his character, is practicing hypocrisy and not self-control. As the mechanic transmutes coal into gas and water into steam, and then concentrates and utilizes the finer forces for the comfort and convenience of others, so the man who intellectually practices self-control transmutes his lower inclinations into the finer qualities of intelligence and morality, to the increase of his own and the world's happiness. A man is happy, wise, and great in the measure that he controls himself. He is wretched, foolish, and mean in the measure that he allows his animal nature to dominate his thoughts and actions. He who controls himself controls his life, his circumstances, his destiny, and wherever he goes he carries his happiness with him as an abiding possession. He who does not control himself is controlled by passions, by his circumstances, and his fate, and if he cannot gratify the desire of the moment he is disappointed and miserable. He depends for his fitful happiness on external things. There is no force in the universe which can be annihilated or lost. Energy is transformed, but not destroyed. To shut the door on old and bad habits is to open it to new and better ones. Renunciation precedes regeneration. Every self-indulgence, every forbidden pleasure, every hateful thought renounced is transformed into something more purely and permanently beautiful. Where debilitating excitements are cut off, there spring up rejuvenating joys. The seed dies that the flower may appear. The grub perishes, but the dragonfly comes forth. Truly the transformation is not instantaneous, nor is the transition a pleasant and painless process. Nature demands effort and patience as the price of growth. In the march of progress, every victory is contested with struggle and pain. But the victory is achieved and it abides. The struggle passes. The pain is temporary only. To demolish a firmly fixed habit, to break up a mental tendency that has become automatic with long use, and to force into birth and growth a fine characteristic of lofty virtue, to accomplish this necessitates a painful metamorphosis, a transitional period of darkness to pass through which patience and endurance are required. This is where men fail. This is where they slip back into their old, easy animal ruts and abandon self-control as too strenuous and severe. They thus fall short of permanent happiness and the life of triumph over evil is hidden from their eyes. The permanent happiness which men seek in dissipation, excitement and abandonment to unworthy pleasure is found only in the life which reverses all this, the life of self-control. So far as a man deviates from perfect self-command, just so far does he fall short of perfect happiness. He sinks into misery and weakness, the lowest limit of which is madness entire lack of mental control, the condition of irresponsibility. Insofar as a man approximates to perfect self-command, just so near does he approach to perfect happiness and rise into joy and strength. So glorious are the possibilities of such divine manhood that no limit can be set to its grandeur and bliss. If a man will understand how intimately, yea, how inseparably self-control and happiness are associated, he has but to look into his own heart and upon the world around to find that there are joy-destroying effects of uncontrolled tendencies. Looking upon the lives of men and women, he will perceive how the hasty word, the bitter retort, the act of deception, the blind prejudice, and foolish resentment bring wretchedness and even ruin in their train. Looking into his own life, what days of consuming remorse, of restless anxiety, and of crushing sorrow rise up before his mind? periods of intense suffering through which he has passed through lack of self-control. But in the right life, the well-governed life, the victorious life, 
All these things pass away. New conditions obtain, and purer, more spiritual instruments are employed for the achievements of happy ends. There is no more remorse, because there is no more wrongdoing. There is no more anxiety, because there is no more selfishness. There is no more sorrow, because truth is the source of action. The much-desired thing which self pursues with breathless and uncontrolled eagerness, yet fails to overtake, comes unbidden and begs to be admitted to him who works and waits in perfect self-command. Hatred, impatience, greed, self-indulgence, 